better pay attention to what engineers use or what they think. And, you know, as far as some engineers I know are concerned, you can wire your speakers with, you know, lamp cord and it's fine. Right. Um, you know, uh, as long as the copper is not corroded. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's been it's been an interesting journey, but I still think like, you know, Monolith still needs to earn uh, customer trust. Uh, I still feel like um, we are, I think for the most part, we're kind of over the hump a little bit, but we're still trying to earn trust of like, why should I buy high end audio from a cable company? Um, there is there is a little bit of that, but um, I think it feels like we're mostly over that. Right. And uh, just to interrupt you one second, um, the feed just went live for some reason, and I'm not sure what the hiccup was on our end. So oh. those of you just seeing us now, you've missed uh, the introduction <laughs> and uh, you missed Hobie and I talking in the beginning. So Hobie, real quick, let me just reintroduce you. Uh, tonight we have Hobie <laughs> uh, Seacrest. He is the uh, business unit manager at Monolith, and I have no idea why the feed just went live, but someone, a message just popped up from, from one of our viewers uh, at 8.19 and said, hey, the feed just picked up. Uh, well, let me let me just finish my thought then, and, it sure. was, and that is how I became a multimillionaire in 15 minutes. Right. That's amazing. I, mm -hmm. And folks, I mean, just go do it. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but yeah, so I apologize to everyone. I'm not sure exactly what happened uh, with our software, uh, not not pushing this out right away, but we are live now and uh, we're talking monolith tonight. Uh, Hobie was just detailing his background of how he got into uh, the industry, essentially starting off, Hobie, you said, working at a, a retail store uh, for discs and movies, uh, moving on to Newegg. And then uh, he's actually the one that came up with the idea for the monolith uh, line. So everyone, Hobie is the one to thank for these amazing products that are coming out at crazy good prices. Um, and Hobie, you said that when you when you've uh, kind of made your pitch internally, it, it wasn't like well received across the board. There were some naysayers. So. Yeah, I mean, well, and, and it's not to uh, disparage anybody. There's naysayer, you know, sure. on everything. And um, yeah. but like one of the um, gentlemen that worked there, and he no, he no longer works here, um, said like, why on earth would anybody buy a two thousand dollar amplifier? Like, why would you even do that? And I knew he was a bicycle enthusiast. He came to work every day with his like thirty five hundred dollar bicycle. Mm. And um, I just looked at him and said, like, yeah, right. Why, why would anybody buy a $3,000 bicycle when I can get one at Target? And he, like, kind of looked at me and went, oh, I guess I get it now. And walked away. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, look, it, it they not they weren't wrong to be skeptical. It's you know you're selling like I said ten dollar HDMI cables trying to jump to selling you know big ticket items. Um, right. It, if I that's what we were just talking question. about now. When uh, when we apparently came live, I had asked Toby about the difficulties of basically going from that brand that's known for low price cables and things of that sort to introducing kind of a higher end product range. Uh, with, you know, granted, you're, I mean, your prices are crazy competitive, but you're still edging into high dollar territory, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's always been the plan. I mean, and some of it is just because the high dollar territory is where you can be disruptive. You know, um, there's a lot of margin out there for various reasons that, you know, our business model can remove. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I'm one of the, you know, working on, like, for instance, I was working on a speaker with, a, you know, the engineer, and he was pointing out the performance of the tweeter, how great it was, and then how much it, it cost, like how relatively inexpensive it was for the performance, like felt he found a component that was, uh, you know, an overperformer. And I said, 
you know, I, and I don't remember what the tweeter was, so I'm just going to use fake numbers. Say the tweeter was 10 bucks, right? And um, I just said, well, all right, what if we got a $15 tweeter? And he was like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, I, we have tons of margin to play with. What if we just make the tweeter even better? And he said, nobody's ever tried to increase cost <laughs> before making a product. And so, I mean, that's where I come in is I try to figure out a way to increase the value and try to, you know, keep the same MSRP um, where I think the product needs to be to sell, uh, mm -hmm. to, to sell well, right? Um, but I kind of, I, tr I keep trying to plus it the whole way through manufacturing uh, because we have, you know, we're removing steps of margin from distribution or from retail that uh, we don't need. And so, or that we're, you know, I don't need to feed as many mouths as, uh, you know, clicks or, or any, any tier one brand that goes through distribution or custom, you know, sure. custom install. Um, so I could play with that and try to add more uh, value to the product. Hmm. Interesting. At the same time, trying to eliminate some of the things where, you know, it's, it's why our finishes are, you know, not, not always, not something like uh salt sound or where the finish is gorgeous or funk audio, you know, that's something I think where me as an enthusiast, I will shortchange for performance of the overall product, especially on something like a subwoofer, as long as it's not hideous. Right. Uh, same with the speaker. Um, you know, it's it's also known where to cut, where to add, and where to cut. And I'm always more worried about sound quality than appearance uh, a little bit. Yeah. And I kind of think, from where our sales are on things, uh, I kind of think that's what our customer feels too. Because you know, mm -hmm. for instance, our our piano black finish. You know, I had a lot of people asking for piano black subs for a while. Um, I put them out. The, the finish was gorgeous. Like, the, um, but they haven't they haven't sold very well. Um, so I think a lot of our customers, the monoprice customers, just um, function over form at the end of the day, is my reading. Uh, it also could be because I went too crazy on the finish. It wasn't just like a hundred buck upcharge. It was like a two hundred, two hundred fifty dollar upcharge, and maybe that for most people, that's a nah, no thanks, that's too much, and I need to. I'm working with the factory to see if we can do uh, it for this. <laughs> you know, have you guys changed the 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 vinyl uh, product that's used on the outside of the sub since the first iteration? Um, no, um, no, no, we might've, we might've changed. The, it looks basically the same. I think we may have went to a, a, a better grade, but it looks the same. It's just still yeah. the same kind of Oak Oak look. Right. Yeah. I remember the, the first one that I reviewed minute. I mean, we're talking like probably seven years ago, maybe Yeah, was, maybe yeah. six six years ago, it, it dinged up a little bit. And, you know, my, my feeling was just what you were just saying though, that you're really looking at an item that you're going to take and put in your room somewhere. You're not going to really be touching it necessarily. And the performance was just kick ass, right? I mean, there's no other way to put it. I mean, right. it's no, yeah. you're saving a ton of money first off. And then second off, you're getting what you're paying for there. Yeah, and that's always been my thought on a subwoofer is like, you know, one, one our subs are incredibly heavy on top of, uh, you know, they're they're big and heavy, right? They're like a small yeah. refrigerator. You can hide your children inside them. Um, <laughs> so you're not, you know, you're really not going to move it around very much. Um, and I kind of, I think, you know, uh, like the sub crawl and all that, like if you're, you know, uh, a real diehard, of course, you're going to do that type of thing. But I think the average person is like, that spot right there is the only place I can put it in this room. That's yeah. where it's going to go. I hope it works out. Right. Um, Cause I know my living room is basically that way. Yeah. Um, luckily it works out the spot I have that my wife, you know, has blessed. Um, it works out. Um, but um, it's a, it's a lot to be able to move around. And, mo and most rooms aren't accommodating unless you have a dedicated room anyway to like, you know, do you still have eight subs? Weren't you using eight subs at one point? I, was, I have four. Oh, four. I would like to have eight. I knew it was a lot. Yeah, I do. I actually, I do have a question for you about that much later on in the show. Um, sure. But yeah, yeah, I do. I, you know, I just, I like bass. I don't know what else to say. Bass is good. I mean, it's yeah. the, um, 
you know, you can, if you have really great subs, I mean, not that, you know, you can get away with speakers that are, uh, a, you know, average and have a, to a totally uh, satisfactory, you know, movie session. You know what I mean? Because the bass is like uh, emotionally satisfying. Like when you're watching, you know, Star Wars or something or, and uh, it's like, it's fine. I thousand percent agree. And I think, uh, that's why I decided to just completely eliminate any concern in the base category because I, you know, during the many iterations of my home theater journey, uh, kind of in my personal life, you know, I started off with an underpowered sub and it took one time when I had some buddies over we were watching, uh, gosh, I can't remember what it was, but it made the sub just choke and chuff and it, yeah. it was a little embarrassing. You know, it was kind of like, ah, oh, well, it sounded really bad right in that moment. So then I upgraded to a little bit more of an expensive sub, a little bit more powerful, but even that just couldn't hang with the demands that I was asking of it. So eventually it got to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go for the big dogs here and just make sure that I have a lot of over, you know, overhead um, or headroom, um, right. which yeah, I've got plenty of that. I'm sure my neighbors would tell you. <laughs> you can be careful with the foundation. Yes. Drywall, you know. Yeah. But yeah. No. Yeah. The. Uh, I mean, more subs, the merrier. If your room can support it, and you can place them right. You know, we're not <laughs> worried about cancel them out and stuff. I mean, I, you know, I've had experience with customers that buy. I mean, setting up a sub can be uh, complicated. You know, because I know where the subs perform, and we'll get. I'll get. You know, invariably get an email from a customer, and it's like, hey, I bought your 15 inch sub, and it's you know, it's horrible. I had no base from this thing. And it's like troubleshooting it sometimes gets hard because sometimes, you know, you want to say I, you might be just sitting in a room mode, you know, a null mm -hmm. um, because I know how these perform. Trust me, you should not be experiencing a uh, base shyness um, with any of the model of subs or, or frankly, any sub from, you know, SVS power sound, rhythmic JTR um, to like, you're going to be happy pretty much with any of those subs. They're all pretty amazing subwoofers. I think mine are great, but greater, no, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> but you know, there, you should be pretty happy with any of the ones you buy. And so if you have an experience like that, there's usually, it's usually a room issue somewhere, you know, like, unfortunately your listening area is right in the null of right. that room, which is what happens a lot. What, what's your estimate of, uh, your, your buying audience in terms of how, uh, how their ability to tackle issues like that. I mean, do you guys provide setup support for the monolith gear? And I would say that's an area of, of weakness that we have is, um, you know, I, I got, you know, I answered, uh, an AVS a long, a while ago, I was probably a, a couple of years, a year ago or so, uh, you know, kind of bashing us for customer service, which I think is, uh often fair but um that is a is a shortcoming that we're trying to work on internally mm -hmm. um because supporting this product is not really in our wheelhouse so but we don't honestly we don't get a lot of questions about of that of that uh type from our customer because most of them are pretty high skilled diy guys and that's why they're buying our product right not just the monolith product but most of them monoprice product they already know what they're getting into um and our own internal research and surveys shows like you know they're not um they're it guys tech savvy um you know a little older so a lot of them i think can troubleshoot on their own um a lot of them are very familiar with like an avs or avian or, or places they can go to get read up and get help on their own sure um i do get emails because my emails out in the wild i'll get it emails randomly from people and i don't i have no problem trying to help them out mm -hmm. um but um yeah and if it doesn't work out you know we'll take it back uh send it back but um usually it works out uh like i said the way the the subwoofer sales are are still growing substantially i don't know if we, i you know we we're cut off but it's like it's the top five category in monoprice from not existing a few years ago to be in the top five um and still, you know, eventually maybe it'll reach, you know, two or three. Number one, I don't think I'll ever reach. It's like H2 Michael. But um, 
you know, we, um, we're, I think we're, we're in a good spot. We got parts coming in. We'll be able to have service our subwoofers without you having to send the whole damn thing back. They'll be able to send you an amp or driver. Uh, usually mm -hmm. it's the amp that goes. I don't think we've ever really had, uh, to be honest with you, a driver failure uh, in inspecting our defects. It doesn't ever look to really be a driver failure. It's usually an amplifier failure, but we do have parts on the way to be in at the end of April, what? and you will no longer need to send the entire thing back to us. What's the main cause of that amp failure in a sub? Because I've had a couple of subs in my hands where the amp just craps out, um, and I just figured it was just getting, it was being pushed too hard. Um, not that I have my room set up uh, overly, you know, hot, but. It, de it depends. Like it's never one thing. And you know, what, what stings it, it's usually like the three cent part. That's a capacitor that's in there. Right. It's um, and we burn, like we burn our subwoofer amplifiers in the factory for like, you know, 72 hours at full speed. Mm -hmm. Like just leave them on, like to try to weed out anything that's just going to blow from getting pushed. Now, I yeah. think you, maybe you could argue, well, it's because you do that eventually they, you know, one of them will crap out, but we don't really like on the whole, we don't really have, like if, if I look at it from a percentage wise, we don't really have a, like an amp defect problem or a defect problem. Uh, but, and it's really random when one goes bad or why one goes bad. One of our viewers is saying heat. Yeah. Is well, of course. Problem? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, interesting. So, um, you 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 had said that there were, um, you know, some challenges with with coming to to market. Uh, what what would you say was the biggest challenge? Obviously, beyond maybe proving your proving the the that you can sell a high dollar product through Monoprice. Yeah, well, I mean, it's. Um... Well, with the consumer, it was trust. Like they can trust us to buy a good product from Monoprice, a product of this caliber from Monoprice, since we we haven't traditionally played in that space. Mm -hmm. um, from from trying, I for me it was trying to find somebody to build them. Um, there's a lot of people you could, work, a lot of folks you can work with to build like your average, I would say, mass retail subwoofer. Like that's actually not that hard to accomplish, right? If you wanted to build you know, what, what you find in Best Buy, not in the Magnolia section, right? That's uh -huh. not that hard to achieve. Um, <clears throat> but to try to find somebody that's going to build like a subwoofer, that looks like a small refrigerator that can put, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's more of a specialty. Um, yeah. And, uh, as I, you know, I, we, I started going down the road with TC Sounds with uh, Tila Stompler way back when, and it looked real promising. And then it just... Um, we had some differences on where MSRP wanted to be, if I recall correctly. Not anything, um, any heated exchanges or anything, but I was like, ah, I think we need to be more like in this area. And he's like, I don't want TC sound. I, he, he was worried about his uh, brand image with TC sound. Yeah. And uh, if anybody remembers them, I don't that they're not. Uh, you wouldn't have anyway. necessarily revealed that relationship. Not necessarily. Yeah. Right. Uh, I felt I did say to him, it'd probably be advantageous for me if we were to do that. But like, I yeah. didn't, you could be the invisible partner. I had no problem with that. Uh -huh. um, there's, there's a lot of invisible partners out in the audio world. Um, but um, so that I went down that path and it didn't work out. And I had like a pro, like I said, the prototype of from that relationship is in the corner of my living room, the tiger, tiger stripe veneer that's on that thing is a, uh, my wife wants me to get rid of this subwoofer. Someday I shall. Um, but it had like a 2400 watt amp on there. It's is, uh, you know, one of those really high powered 15 inch woofers that everybody loved at the time. Um, but then luckily I started working with Clarity Audio. You know, I went through, uh, sort of going through an RFQ process with like three different factories. Uh, Clarity easily had done this before, you know, Dan Romer was obviously an engineer that was smart and Robert Wills that managed it. So they had built several great subwoofers before. So I knew I was in good hands. And then it was just about trying to really push the limit of what we can do at the price point and where, you know, like my job is like, is we got to have, is I, you know, this is the, where the performance needs to be. We need to make sure we hit it. Um, 
and I need to keep, you know, at a, at this price point, and that's sort of my job because uh, I'm not an engineer, um, but um, I know enough to get me in some trouble sometimes and try and figure some things out or think I figured something out. And the engineer just looks at me and goes, yeah, that's not how it works. <laughs> um, sometimes it's just like, make the box bigger. Um, okay. We could do that. You know, you know um, just give me more air volume. That way we'll get more output. So, right. um, I mean, it was a fun process uh, and obviously they came out really well. So I'm curious about, you know, you're saying, uh, building to a certain performance spec. Is there ever a moment where you, um, you're saying, Hey, we, we need to get out like a, a 16 inch driver. I mean, just for market perception for your customer, if they were looking specifically maybe for driver size, not necessarily looking at the performance numbers. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Um, I think they go hand in hand though. Yeah, they like, do. I, like, um, I mean, I know I've gotten asked about doing an 18 inch driver. And I'm not, uh, you know, I don't think I'm quite ready to go there yet. You know what I mean? Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, there's, I always have feel the need to try to push the envelope and I feel like I have a good, uh, idea of what our customer wants and when we should launch, um, products but i think you would see more like a dual 16 from us than an 18 anytime soon um but it's tough i mean and some of it is like watching you know trying to keep up with the joneses or watching what your competition does you know what i mean like granted if somebody puts out a subwoofer that changes the landscape then you have to react um Whereas I think we put out subwoofers that kind of that changed the, the landscape a little bit. We were we outperformed some people and were cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so you've seen certain brands completely redo their entire assortment. There's a reason anytime any factory or any factory, any brand or company seems to redo their entire assortment, that's very timely, time consuming and costly. Yeah. There's a there's there's a reason somebody has disrupted them. So yeah, they have to go figure out how to compete, how to get their market space back. Right. Or find a new or find a different niche. You know what I mean? I think some of the, some people have just found a different uh, niche. Right. That's what um, I meant. Yeah. Find a new right. place where they can establish themselves. What is there, is there a reason why uh, sealed subs? I mean, as far as I know, you guys have only ported at this point. Is that correct? That's correct. Is there a reason why you haven't gone down the sealed path? Well, we did. We um, I remember I did, them. I, they were they didn't sell. Um, huh. They were short lived. So, I, so my takeaway, and I've I've said this in other uh, when people have asked me, it's um, I kind of think size doesn't matter to the, our customer, like they don't care of this because the, you know, the advantage of sealed outside of, if you have, you know, a feeling one way or other about how they sound, right. That's a little smaller, mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't think anybody really cares how big it is. Um, and so it didn't matter. And the, in the other end, you could on our sub, they come with port plugs, right? You can plug up the port to make it sealed anyway, if you really want to. Right. Um, and, you know, and I, and I, I think our customer also is one of those guys that's like, I call it, you know, the drag strip. He wants maximum drag strip, which is like all the output by frequency response, you know, the CEA 2034, you know, he, or uh, yeah, 2010, like he wants all that output. That's why he's buying our subwoofer. Right. Um, you know, uh, and that's, I mean, you know, like I, there's spreadsheets out there, like sweet chaos from, you know, ASR who like, took every uh, CEA 2010 measurement from every reviewer, put it in a spreadsheet. That's very helpful to me too. Um, Cause I just like, you know, we do better than this and have lower distortion and this is where we need to be. Like it's a lot of good guidance. I mean, but I, I did, I did that spreadsheet for myself when I started Monolith because I knew like, this is where you need to be. It's like, I can't put out a slower Ferrari. Right. right and win. Like that's a harder story. 
Right. Right. If they go, it's slower, you know, you know, it's like putting out a car that drives slower, but you keep saying, but feels better. Um, you know, it's a hard road to, to go if your marketing is, you know, doesn't measure as well, but sounds better. Like, I think that is a, a harder story. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to partner with TA Tracks is just another way to affirm uh, for the customer that these are really amazing subwoofers. And, you know, here's a third party that have that will assert that for you. Um, that they're, you know, certain, like, you know, at the time, the 12 inch was THX Ultra, a no 12 inch. I don't, I think there might have been one other 12 inch sub, but in general, a 12 inch subwoofer doesn't achieve Ultra in any of their testing. Mm -hmm. um, our 12 inch does. So, but our two of our 10 inches, I think, will hit Ultra. But um, it's not, yeah. it's not common. What, the relationship with THX, did you kind of see that as a necessity from the get go? Uh, yeah, the in, at the inception, yeah. Yeah. I felt like, well, and, and some of it is just nostalgia for me, too. Like, I remember when uh, THX meant something on some of the mastering side of, like, a THX certified laser disc or a THX certified DVD, THX certified speakers. Um, sure. And they had kind of, I felt, um, they had ebbed a little bit and brand uh, awareness for a little while uh, and they were trying to make a comeback and, and um, to build the brand back up to mean something in the market. And it was just perfect timing. They were hungry. I was hungry to work with them. And um, we were able to, you know, not only work with them on subwoofers, but also work with them on like the THX AAA headphone amplifier technology, um, which, you know, they showed me at Cedia. It might've been the Cedia we first met, like this little board um in a glass case and had me listen to a headphone on it and i was like yeah that sounds great and so yeah put it you know we started trying to figure out how to manufacture that uh together unfortunately drop or a mass drop beat me to market but because i decided my genius i put a DAC in it instead of just doing an app uh, an amp a, a headphone amp by itself but um so <laughs> i took longer to develop sometimes you look back but um <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, so I all the guys at THX have been great, like Jason Fiber, uh, Jason Marr, who has moved on, and all the guys there have all been really great to work with. So, how does that work from a kind of inception of of a model through getting it to a final phase? Are you working hand in hand with them along the way, or do you basically send out a final prototype to them for testing and then get feedback? It, it, it kind of works like that. Um, I mean, uh, granted, like working with Clarity Audio or, or uh, and with Dan and Robert, like they'd had some experience working with THX. So they, I, I don't know how it would be from somebody that's never worked with them before. But yeah, that's basically how it goes. But, you know, you build your prototype, you send it over and they put it through the test and they're like, nah, doesn't make it. Hmm. And then they give you some feedback you know, distortion's a little high or, you know, you get a little hang on the sub or your gain's a little noisy, stuff like that. And then you kind of fix it there. But with uh, Dan, you didn't really have to, it's usually the first try. Interesting. And they're, some of their testing is proprietary too. So it's not like they share what they're testing. So it's a guessing game. It's sort of like the MPAA where you submit a movie and they're like, this is our, and you're like, well, why is right. it R? But they can't tell you explicitly because that's censorship. Right. But they can say like, I don't know, it feels too sexy or it feels too <laughs> bloody. But, um, but um, not that a subwoofer could be either of those. And if it right. is, here's a number you can call. But um, <laughs> but, but um, the um, so sometimes you don't. You know, I mean, it's not like it's that. It's like overly opaque. But um, it's uh. It, it it ended up being like it, it worked out. I you know I would do it again if I had it. I had to. Yeah, it was definitely a very smart move to uh, do it from the get go. Yeah, well, thank, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, well, yeah, go ahead. No, no, and that's why I did it on the um, the speakers, like with the THX certification on the speakers, uh, the on walls, on, so on the in walls. Um, I figured just sort of, you know, keep it, keep it all in the family, 
Um, and that way too, you know, you can kind of, you can mix and match a lot of the products and it's all going to work well together mm -hmm. uh, in your room. What's it, what's the, uh, the, um, what, what's the, uh, the term I'm looking for here in, in terms of reception, are you finding people are gravitating more towards traditional floor standing speakers and bookshelf speakers, or are those on wall, in wall, in ceiling speakers, uh, a more desirable product at this point? Um, you know, yeah, it's like from sale. Well, like in sales doesn't mean everything like, cause we are, we're a strange company. So we sell a lot of our, a lot of in wall. Um, mm -hmm. And honestly, on like the on the uh, in wall speaker, I launched the TH. Uh, what do I call it? Man, sometimes I don't even remember my own models at this point. Uh, the four sixty five in wall, like uh -huh. it's a seven hundred dollar in wall. We sell a lot of those, like way more than I ever anticipated. Um, but uh, I think the market is still predominantly bookshelf and towers and things so like the that. So traditional, I, you know, yeah. I mean, we sell an awful lot of those. like those speakers have done really well. The encore speakers have done really well and the auditions, which just come out are starting to kind of get going. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, for most people that's because even I don't want to put holes in my wall. You know, I really I mean, if it's a dedicated room, I actually actually, you know, even if I did a dedicated room, and this is just me spitballing, <laughs> but like even if I did a dedicated room, like um, which I want to do, my wife has given the okay. I'm excited, but yeah, now you gotta jump I, on have, that. <laughs> I have to not be lazy, or the window will close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I still don't know if I would go in walls. For I personally have some sort of like I feel like a, a box speaker is better. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I've heard speakers based on in wall or uh, systems based on in wall in ceilings speakers that are just freaking amazing. So I know it really isn't a limitation, but um, I feel like I don't know. I feel like I would probably still use box speakers in a dedicated room. Yeah, at least I mean I guess you could potentially go in wall in the surrounds. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I think for Atmos, like doing an in ceiling would be fine Pro probably yeah there's just not that much information coming through it um like your front front three so right. um interesting very interesting well listen there's a a lot of people in here uh who are asking questions about that yeah um do you want to tell us what that is uh that's skynet no <laughs> um <laughs> the uh so that are, those are HTP ones. That's a photo from today. Those are HTP ones uh, in various stages of assembly, waiting for uh, one final component board, which should be coming in next week. Um, so they are finally on their way. When I mentioned, I believe, on Youthman's, they should be coming in January. That's what we all thought until we forgot to order one component, uh, which is not my fault. I would say not that I'm passing the buck, but it's not me. No, I'm just but um, uh, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> so they should be on their way. We are trying to finalize uh, a firmware to have DTS X, uh, X Pro operating, but I may not wait for that because I know a lot of people want to get one as sooner than later. And yeah, I don't know if DTS X Pro is the uh, worth the hold up at the, you know, you know what I mean? If I can right. hold it up to finish a firmware. So, um, well, they already have really, PSX on, on it. So you're just talking yeah, about they just don't have X pro functionality. Right. The, the sad part is, is it already can decode DTS X pro. It's just the GUI doesn't recognize that it's being decoded. So it's just updating the GUI, um, or the user interface. Well, GUI, GUI is the user interface, but, um, once we do that, then it'll be fine. Um, but yeah, they are, um, they're that's in custom being assembled right now. How uh, how long have these been on hold now? Not not these particular models here, but how long have they been out of stock? Uh, I like a year and a half. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been it's like the more most frustrating thing ever. 
sure I mean, and, and it's nobody's fault. It's like just component shortages, the, you know, AKM burning down. Um, you know, AKM did bring back the, the 4493 back, but like some of the components we used with the 4493 um, didn't come back. So like we couldn't just drop in the new chip. Um, luckily, we had enough 4493s to do another round. Like we were able to uh, cobble, you know, claw and scrap together enough to keep building them. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, and then we, you know, we were working through some iterations on uh, components. But components just, you know, some things got became uh, 52 week lead time. Um, on, and like it, it's the craziest stuff. Like it'd be a two cent part on a board, and all of a sudden it's got a sixty-five week lead time, and it's like, oh. And then like, part of me is like, well, why don't we just redesign the board to where we don't need that part? But then that's going to take as long as waiting for the part. Sure. Um, so it's just it's been a, a frustrating uh, experience for everybody involved. Of course, we want to always have this out there for sale. Um, oh, of course. Well, it's been wildly popular for a very good reason. Yeah, so. I, um, it's the, yeah. Thank you. the The feedback was tremendous. I felt like when we launched it, um, I paid probably you know the engineer would say I paid too much attention to uh, uh, feedback on the forums and from emails I got. But I tried to you know any feedback we got that was a problem we tried to address right away. We tried to add. Uh, things people wanted from it, you know, like uh, REW, um, Rune mm -hmm. integration. Um, hell, what else did we do? Uh, you know, so we really try to build it from the enthusiast point of view and make it easy to use. Right. Um, you know, the only like the difference between me and how, what I see enthusiasts, uh, other folks on like the boards is they sure play around with their processors a lot. Like, like I'm like, like me. I stick my processor in my rack. I set it up with Dirac um, or Odyssey or Trinov, whatever the flavor may be. But I don't really fiddle with it too much after that. Like I just watch my movies on it because it always sounds amazing. But there are definitely you know, a lot of folks really um, seem to mess around with the settings a lot. Uh, you know, I, I had a lot of, uh, I had not a lot, but I had a few people actually, you know, ask me if I can, Keep on going where they can use the HTTP one for uh, you know active crossovers, which you almost could. I mean, like it's not really designed for that, but like that is a very fringe, you know, like a, a fringe case uh, yeah. where we would have to develop. We would have to develop something to be a little finer and control as far as setting a crossover. But um, you know, so, so there was a lot, a lot of, of people out there that really like to dig into the weeds of these things. Yes. Well, and that's what's cool about this is if, you, if you're that guy, you can, mm -hmm. you know, like we had, you know, we also had more filters, set, like you can store more, you know, uh, room corrections than a lot of the other processors. Um, uh, you know, it c comes equipped with Dirac, a lot of the full suite of Dirac Live without any upgrade. We were pretty quick to be base control compatible um, through a firmware update. Um you know, as we were speaking before the show, there should be compat. This will be compatible with active room treatment when we're allowed to be compatible with it. Um, we are going uh, back and forth with. Uh, yes, it's not too early. Yeah. Um, we're planning to. We're, we can uh, do to some. I think. You know, I don't know. If, well, we should have it by October first. Okay. So I think I think Storm has exclusivity until October first, but then we should be able to be. We'll be able to be compatible with October first. Um, right. It may or may not be a firmware update. Um, the, so I do have some mixed information is that it may already be compatible without even needing to do a firmware update. Like we have enough bandwidth uh, built into our pro our processor. Our, when I say processor, I mean I got core CPU components and uh, uh, some of the database storage already that has enough bandwidth to hold the additional filters and taps that Dirac will use for active room treatment. Um, so unbeknownst to us, having that extra uh, headroom may actually save us from doing a firmware. But we're still working through that a little bit with directors, some big signals there. But if we have to do a firmware, obviously, we're going to do a firmware. Um, yeah. So it should. Uh, our plan is to have support by October 1st. That's really great news. When, when I talked to them at CES, they kind of indicated that most 
processors that are running Dirac Live and uh, capable of having the base module um, should be able to to run R. I mean, obviously, you would know a lot more about that it, than I would at this point, but it should. It's about I think Art takes um, like it's an extra. And I man, I don't you know I don't know if this is like under NDA. I don't remember, <laughs> but but like it, it does take some extra processing. I won't say. Mm -hmm. explicitly how much uh into an extra bandwidth but i think we had enough of, of the extra bandwidth already to cover it i believe yeah but like i say either way our goal is to have it uh, be compatible with it by october 1st so if if these new units are shipping with dtsx pro that means that uh there should be a firmware update along the way at some point for current users yes yeah, so, uh, right so we are working on a firmware for DTSX Pro that will be released to everybody. It, the real question I have is, do I hold these up? So these will basically ship with DTSX Pro built in and then we'll release the firmware or just get them back out on the market. And when the firmware is ready, the firmware is ready. Um, mm -hmm. That's something I'm wrestling with internally. Okay. In my um, head. Nobody else. There's nobody else. <laughs> Should we take an online vote? <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, here, here's a really good question. I was going to ask you about this because you know you talk about uh, you know chip shortages and all of these factors that have come along with COVID and part supply issues. Are you guys going to be able to keep the price where where it is, or? are you looking at possibly having to bump the price up in the future here? Uh, it might need to get, I need to do some final math. It might need to get bumped up, but it's not going to get bumped up like a thousand, but it would, it would get bumped up a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. So maybe something like 42 99 instead of 39 99. Right. You know, it's, I mean, so many, uh, electronics manufacturers have cranked prices up significantly. I mean, that's, you're talking about a, you know, my math, like a 7% increase, maybe. Well, um, I can tell you on the subwoofers in the amplifier section, there's a component that used to cost like a dollar 50 and you need four of them to sub. They now cost $14 each. Yeah. So that's a big job. And obviously that's a big, um, it's a big expense to eat. Um, and we were able to control some of that because Monoprice does have some buying power. Um, obviously, uh, you know, everybody's got pretty good relationships with everybody, but um, yeah, we, we, you know, we had to increase the subwoofer pricing a little bit too over, you know, the past 12 to 18 months because um, everything's crept up and you know, yeah. it's one of those things where they don't go, it tends to not go back down. It's kind of like eggs, right? Eggs will be like go up to twelve bucks, and they'll go, they'll settle back down to eight bucks. And they'll go, see, eggs went down in price; they're only eight bucks, and it's like right. eggs, but they were <laughs> totally they unfair. Were four, they were four bucks, so if I, you know, um, that's kind of how these price increases or pricing things tend to work. And so, once it happens, once they realize people are willing to pay for it, it's not coming back down, right? Or if it does come back down, it never gets back to where it was. Right. Um, but, you know, we also factor in other things like currency uh, exchange. You know, sometimes that gets favorable and we'll try to buy, you know, time purchases at that at that time. Um, if we can ever, you know, if we get that sophisticated. Sometimes we're able to. Sometimes we're like, what happened? Oh, oh, you, you know. Um, but um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been the last, ever since the, the pandemic, it's been a little crazy. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the 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 biggest part of the price increases isn't really component cost. At, at one point, it was you know freight in from China. Your container right. went from costing you like thirty five hundred bucks a container to eighteen thousand dollars. Wow, that I yeah. mean, so how do you absorb that? You know, yeah. Do you, I, mean, I think at one point, and this is probably back when we first met in like 2017, 2016, you had mentioned to me that Mon you have an advantage at, at Monoprice, especially as you were kind of launching the, the Monolith line, because the company is so healthy and, and does such high volume sales, you felt like you had a little leeway 
in that product ca category. Um, does the same yeah. kind of lean into this this whole issue of price increases too? Are you able to not have to yeah. hit the gas yeah. as much as other people may? Yeah. So yeah, actually, no, I remember that comment. It's true. Like I, you know, Monolith price doesn't live or die on Monolith sales, right? So if Monolith went away, Monolith price is fine. I mean, now it's definitely a nice addition to the overall portfolio uh, and sales volume of the company. Uh, and it's one of the fastest growing things in the history of the company in terms of like a, a sub brand. Um, hmm. But, um, you know, so I, I'm able to get kind of sporty in some of my pricing. And to your point, I can absorb some things where maybe some other people where this is their only product. You know, you like you look at some of our competitors, um, or actually you look at most product companies, you know, they may have 10 products. Right. And we have 8,500. Right. And, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of different conversation when, you know, your entire company relies on the sales of your six subwoofers or something like that, mm -hmm. um, where we don't. And, that, you know, it's allowed us to be ultra competitive with our pricing and, yeah, like uh, absorb some things and then, you know, try some products out that, you know, maybe we wouldn't have tried otherwise. Right. Um, we have a question from one of our viewers here, and I'm not sure the boot loop issue. Are you yes. familiar with that? Yes. Will it be addressed? Uh, yes. So there. we, um, we know what we find. So it's been actually, so the boot loop thing has been really hard to address for us because it's not repeatable. It's one of those things when, so it ends up being, uh, a power issue. So what's happening with most people that have a boot loop, and it's, it's weird because a lot of people, there have been a couple of guys on ABS that are geniuses that have written some code that's kind of corrected the boot loop issue, but it actually has something to do with the power supply at one of the boards, which is power. There's a power outage of maybe uh, milliseconds, right? Which is why, like, if I look at where we get boot loop returns from, they're very they're kind of specific regions that have maybe more power issues than other rural. Hmm. Um, but and um, what happens is, is that when the power comes out and it comes back, for some reason, the Olamex processor, I believe, is the Olamex processor doesn't quite boot all the way. And so it stays in this locked state. Um, and so we've addressed that. Um, hopefully we're gonna address it through firmware, but we've also addressed it uh, in a hardware, but I don't think we'll need to retrofit people uh, once we finish the firmware. Because it'll kind of, it'll, it'll basically fix Olamex, but we fixed it in hardware, I believe in these new units. Cool. I mean, Sounds what's interesting, What's what's um and I'm trying to because this was a con this was a big conversation back in November, which is why I'm trying to be careful with, with I'm making sure I remember it correctly. But um it's sometimes the the uh, the noise online isn't like the isn't the reality because it's like the internet, you know, everybody goes and posts when there's a problem, but nobody goes and says when there's no problem, right? Mm -hmm the majority of like HTTP ones, like don't seem to really have a problem. That's why we were able to kind of finally, uh, one of the uh, QA testers at uh, ATI is, is like a freaking genius, like figure basically finally figured out what was happening because we couldn't, uh, we couldn't replicate it. Um, like we knew there was this issue, but we could never really replicate it internally hmm. um, to really fix it. Um, like for the longest time, we thought it was a networking issue, but it's not really a networking issue. That's really interesting. So, I mean, would a UPS just, would that solve that issue? Uh, in our testing, it, it seems to. Yeah. I don't want to say definitively, but like it right. seems it sounds to. Like it's like a quirk that's really, yeah, it's yeah. difficult for you to recreate. Yeah. But um, when we did have a hooked up to UPS, we, it didn't happen. So I don't want to tell people to go buy a UPS though, because you shouldn't have to go buy a UPS just to have your processor function. Yeah, I mean, but, those, um, are, those are, can be very expensive. Right. But, um, 
yeah, hopefully these units will be immune from that. So, I'll find out more. Unfortunately, um, Morris has been off on vacation in Hawaii the past couple of weeks, so I will get uh, debriefed when he gets back. Okay. <laughs> um, what's going on in the uh, amplifier front with you guys? Do you have any announcements coming up? Um, we should. So we are. I'm finishing up. Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how exciting they are. They're just basically 100 watt per channel amplifiers. So we have the 200 watt per channel amplifiers that we've carried this whole time. So it's just a step down uh, in power and a big step down in price. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, two, three, five, seven by 100 or actually 90 watts, all channels driven. Um, amps. so like you could use it as your a secondary amp for effects channels or high channels. Um, and they're going to be pretty, uh, pretty inexpensive, all things considered, especially compared to the 200 watt wide guys. Awesome. Like the uh, the seven channel one should be 599, 699 for seven by 100, and it has both RCA and XLRs. They're not balanced or anything. They're not balanced or, um, but no, there will be XLR inputs on them. Interesting. Um, ah, I had a question for you. Now I forgot it. Someone on here was asking about an 11, 11 channel amp. Let's well, we have one. At yes. that will they be, will it be available soon? I guess, is it on back order right now? Yeah, it's on, it's out of stock right now and on back order. Yep. It's probably going to be three or four months, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's been the case for a lot of items. Um, we had a question. Let me see. I thought this one was kind of interesting. Here we go. Have you ever considered bringing out any acoustic panels, diffusers, absorbers, anything along those lines to uh, kind of go after that market? I uh, I have. Um, I've had a hard time finding a supplier. Um, mm. And the and the the challenging thing for us, since we're, you know, obviously we're internet only, direct to consumer, is shipping some of these things, or just because of the dimensional weight, not really the actual weight, but the dimensional weight of you know, like room treatment things like that, it just puts some of the shipping costs kind of sky high. I don't know how much of a value it is to uh, the customer, but it is something where I'm I'm keen on trying to figure out. Uh, also like a, you know, a subwoofer platform too. Like you put your sub on like, a, I think, uh, something I want to try to figure out, but sometimes these, these projects, because I'm the only guy that does monolith, mm -hmm. um, like they, I get, I end up deprioritizing prioritizing them because I want to work on something. Uh, so you're talking about like a, almost like an ISO acoustics type platform yeah. that you would place yeah. it on. So there would be no vibrations. Right, like a Run sub dude, sub grandma, sub -dude, yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, like I think that would be a cool uh, product for us to carry as an add-on to our subwoofers. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I took a good hard look at room treatment uh, and diffusers a couple of years ago, uh, and just I couldn't, uh, I just couldn't find somebody I was happy with the quality of the product. I think at that time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it would be it would make sense for us to carry some of that stuff. So. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I just speaking uh, for myself and probably for a lot of people who are watching some sort of video processing unit would be a really interesting thing for uh, monolith to attack also because those are catching fire and they're super expensive. Yeah, I don't I think there, so. And I think there's a good reason for that. Not that I wouldn't want, you know, like, you know, take on mad VR or something, but um that is a, almost a hundred percent like an engineering ex, like exercise, right? So the but the market is super niche. Oh, yeah. I, I, like this is my opinion, right? And so those prices have to be sky high to be able to just support uh, staying in business. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what kind of velocity their uh, velocity there actually would be. I mean, the product is like amazing. I mean, like we were talking earlier, like you know, I remember the first DVDO, like the Ice Scan. Like I was like three, two pull down. This is amazing um, <laughs> right. to, to be where, uh, you know, where we are now, you know, not have flicker or when a 480p DVD player came out. 
Um, to, but to be where we are now, um, with the complexities of like HDR and on the projector, and how do you keep all your highlights with that? You know, how having it look weird and things like that. Um, I think knowing where our strengths are, I think that's probably better for somebody else to tackle, uh, yeah. not us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, listen, Hobie, it's been an hour. I know you're probably hungry. You're on the West Coast. Uh, I don't eat. Look at me. It's you think I eat? <laughs> it's Come a perfect. On. I got to go for a run and then hitting the gym after this. What are you talking about? There you about? go. <laughs> so are you, that's are actually, you gonna... that's probably what you're going to do. But no one. <laughs> I'm going to be getting into bed. Is what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> that's next on my agenda for this evening. Um, are you going to be out at Cedia this year? Um. I, I hope so. I mean, we've kind of stayed away. Yeah, we've only stayed away for just mainly because of the pandemic and being unsure, like what the crowds are going to be and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think this year might make sense to kind of go back. Yeah. Um, I was kind of hoping, I kind of want to do Expona, but we couldn't get our get it together internally. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's time to kind of get back to the show. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think Cedia this past year was was uh good so you know I, i'm only assuming it's going to be better this coming year but it seemed like a pretty decent crowd i don't want to say numbers because i'm not quite sure i think they right. reported 15 or sixteen thousand. yeah that's um, not bad the, the the feedback i got from other people was that attendance was pretty good so then i, th I think it makes sense to kind of uh to start getting back in the swing of the shows and like, I, I want to, for me personally, like I want to do, I would love to get to like Expona and there's a, the home entertainment show, which is down here in Costa Mesa by me, mainly because those are public facing shows. Um, and I think like, since we're internet only, it's probably a good idea to have people be able to listen to a touch, feel the product and see it. Um, sometimes when we do like a CDA or CES, which is mostly trade only, uh, you know, there's value in folks like yourself talking about the product and media, but like everybody at the show kind of gets the product. Yeah. You know, um, understands it. It'd be great to get it out in front of people that can hear it and talk about it. Yeah. So that's okay. something I'm going to start working on for the next, you know, 18 months. Cool. Well, I hope, cool. I hope I get a chance to see you, um, this year. And Likewise. Uh, if not, uh, we'll definitely be in contact. If you, I'm going to take you offline real quick, Kobe. Um, so just want to publicly say thank you uh, for, for coming on. But I do have a question for you offline. Okay. Um, so let me uh, wrap up the stream here. And well, Let me just say uh, to everybody watching, thanks for being interested in Monolith. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. And thanks for having me on. Awesome. Okay. All I'll right. see you in just a sec. Okay. Um, okay. So folks, uh, listen, that was, a that was an awesome chat. Uh, thank you so much for everybody who tuned in. I apologize for, uh, the little hiccup we had there with the beginning of the stream. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but, uh, if you're just tuning in now, we apparently lost about the first 15 minutes of our episode. So uh, just for those of you who are just coming on or who have stuck around since that time and just wanted to show you uh, some of the things going on over at the forum at avnirvana.com. We've got uh, the new Sony TVs uh, we're talking about. Uh, Michael Scott uh, reviewed Training Day in 4K. We have our new Base Hunters episode. That is Violent Night. That is the 4K Dolby Atmos version of Violent Night. Uh Check out right below that on the right-hand side of your screen. You will see I spent some time over at uh, Sound United's headquarters. That's Mosmo Consumer. And got to check out the AV10 processor and the AMP10 along with those new DefTech Dimension speakers. So if you want to get a little bit of an inside look at what's going on there, there's a YouTube video along uh, with some written impressions about the uh, the amp 10 and av 10 uh, that i had uh while i was out there and uh, we also have some new appearing reviews up so listen all you guys are enthusiasts i know a lot of people have forms where they're comfortable but we'd love to have you come over and hang out with us also uh avnirvana.com it's very easy to sign up you can sign in with your uh, facebook login if you so choose 
But aside from that, we will be coming back at some point, possibly by the end of this month with another episode of AV Nirvana Live. I just want to thank everybody out there for checking in with us and uh, for consuming our content. And definitely all of you out there, uh, I see quite a few of our forum members have popped in tonight. Thank you so much for being members over at our forum. We've got some fun giveaways coming up through Aperion and also a 4K uh, HDMI 2.1, or I should say 8K HDMI 2.1 uh, fiber optic cable. So uh, come back for that too. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great evening. If you enjoy content like this, hit like, subscribe, and then join the conversation on avnirvana.com.